continuing the Sermon on the Mount. So, uh, where did we end? After the Beatitudes, depending on how you want to count that last two, I think they're really one and the same. Blessed are they that are persecuted. And then blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Seem to be the same. So let's put it at eight, which is a number of completion in the Bible. So eight Beatitudes. After which Jesus gives a commentary, as it were, in our present distress. And he's calling upon his disciples to be as he has intended us to be. And as we have been from the foundations of the earth, the salt of the earth. And so ye are the salt of the earth, he says, 13th verse. But, he said, if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, trodden under foot of men. Now, um, in those days, that was the great refrigeration, you know, used salt to preserve things. But salt is so useful, so wonderfully useful, as a matter of fact. All we think about is when there's ice on the road, is there enough salt, you know, the news people go interview the salt, Truck. That's, that's a, I get a kick out of this. One inch of snow tomorrow, you know, so they're out with a microphone. You think we'll have enough salt? Yeah, I think we have. Guy Costa used to be the, I don't know if he's still out there. <laughs> yeah, I think we have enough salt. <laughs> a friend of mine is, used to be uh, on Channel uh, 4, Alan Jennings, and we were just talking recently, and we laugh about this because, you know, he said they used to send him out on these assignments uh, because, you know, weather is a big news. It's big news. And it, it, it trumps all other stories. There could be murders and rapes. And, no, no, weather is the first thing. There's going to be an inch of snow tomorrow. And the severe weather, severe weather. And he said they'd go on, you know. And uh, there, was, there wasn't anything to report. So they'd have to go up to Seven Springs where they manufacture snow. And they'd go there with the ruler, you know, obligatory ruler in the snow to show you, you know, six inches of snow, get everybody all scared and worked up and so on. And they used to go into the stores, the local stores, and interview, you know, the storekeepers. And after a while, the storekeepers got so fed up with it, they'd say, you know, don't bother us. We're not interested in it. But a lot, a lot of people love to be on TV, I guess. But at any rate, did we have enough salt? Well, salt, the preserver, the preserver of the earth. And so believers are called to this. And we are doing this very important work, and we stopped this morning right there in this important job that we have, and that is to stand against the wiles of the devil, having done all to stand, as a matter of fact. So we're standing up, standing on the promises of God, and standing against evil wherever it rears its ugly, uh, multi-hydra-headed, uh, fiendish grin. We want to be able to defeat the devil. So we're the great preserving power against the devil, we're impeding his progress. And again, that should make everybody here rather feel rather important, as a matter of fact. So we are serving a purpose. Amen. Now, where do I take this, this concept? I think, uh, you know, Jesus is indicating this when he speaks of uh, salt having savor and understanding metaphorically, meaning that it has a preserving element. And so the only reason, won't this be something? is when we stand before God and the history is finally actually given to us. We have revisionist history today. We don't have much true history. And in secular universities and secular college campuses, certainly high schools and junior highs, they just give you secular history. They don't give you the real history. Uh, I, I like the expression, his, history is his story. It's God's story. And when we get to heaven, the books will be opened. The book of life itself, certainly, and, and all of the events of human history will unfold. And there we'll see things that we'll find so obviously curious to us now. And in those days, I think we'll find it curious as well as we look and see what was it that uh, helped the Allied forces to conquer Hitler. And uh, we're going to see some things that I think will shock us. It'll be some 90-year-old woman uh, kneeling on her bony knees, you know, arthritic knees, and she's praying and asking God to deliver the troops. We'll see things like this and we'll be amazed at it, right? We'll see somebody that was perhaps praying for you before you were even born. Maybe somebody in the past, the genealogy. Might, you'll find them in heaven someday, a great-great-grandfather that was saved and began there praying for all those that would come thereafter. And uh, we'll see all of the history, finally, and it's, uh, all of its nuance and all of its use and diffusions. And we'll see it as it truly is. 
and what actually moved the arm of God throughout history. Uh, and I think we'll be amazed at when we see how much our witness thwarted the powers of evil in the world. Now, I know that it doesn't look very good right now and uh, much to lament over, but realize that Jesus gave us, in a sense here, a rather sharp rebuke. He said, if the salt has lost its savor, so if it isn't going to preserve anymore, the devil then has free course and he can continue on, he can move ahead and he can, he can do uh, what he wants to accomplish ultimately. So the church is the preserving element. Now we're going to take this from a passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I think it's the definitive chapter uh, when you want to understand the chronology of the rapture and the tribulation. I think you really have to go to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 16 through chapter 5, and then 2 Thessalonians chapters 1 and 2. And if you put all that together, it's a wonderful prophetic uh, puzzle. And what are we going to find here but... Uh, now he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now I understand, when one looks at that passage, you would say this, this is arcane. In other words, it demands interpretation. It's esoteric. So the meaning isn't obvious. It's not sitting on the text that you can understand. You would have to study it to see what this is all about. Uh, let's not forget that we're dealing with the mystery of iniquity on one side. And so the mystery and the power of the church is on the other. So he who now letteth will let. So there's contest about who is the he here, right? So the church often is found in a feminine form. Uh, but uh, isn't this the Holy Spirit? He who now letteth will let. Remember Isaiah speaks about, you know, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against the, the flood of iniquity that's coming in. And so the, the Holy Spirit is he who now restrains. But uh, the Holy Spirit is limited. He has to work through the church. And this is, this, these are the guidelines that God said, now uh, all power uh, in heaven and earth is given unto you. So this is the Great Commission of Matthew 28. So all power is given unto you. And uh, so how is it given to us? Well, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So now every believer that is saved has been baptized by the Holy Ghost and has now the potential of, of preserving power within their hearts. We are the objects you know, that are in the way of Satan's onslaught. What seems to be the invincible juggernaut of evil is a slowed down. Uh, we put the brakes on, so to speak, and, the, uh, and we're stopping the progress. So, he who now letteth, and the word there is a bit archaic, but restrains. For uh, we know what withholdeth, uh, that he might be revealed in his time. Antichrist, uh, what's holding him back is what this bit passage is saying. For the mystery of iniquity doth already uh, work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So uh, this restraining force that the Holy Spirit exercises through the instrumentality of his church that he now empowers so that we can stand against the evil one. We are, we are holding him back. Then shall that wicked be revealed. So once taken out of the way. So clearly this is a pre-tribulation rapture. What's holding the Antichrist back? He's waiting in the wings. He's had a man in every generation that could easily have fulfilled his desires. Uh, he has them to this day in high office even now. And uh, whenever the devil wants to take over, just as he did with Judas Iscariot, uh, when he uh, was ready to betray Christ, the devil entered him. And I believe that there's probably phantom figures throughout generations. As John says, there are already many antichrists. Uh, preterists like to say, well, Nero was the antichrist. He was, a, he was an antichrist, but not the antichrist. And he could have been, but God said, not yet. Not yet. Second century, third century, fourth century. So we have Constantine, we have Charlemagne. We have Otto the Great, we have uh, the popes and all of their nonsense uh, through the dark ages and keeping people in bondage and superstition. And, uh, we've had uh, uh, Stalin in Russia, we've had Hitler in Germany, we've had Mao in China, we've had uh, Idi Amin. And we've got all these different antichrists that have already been here. Any one of them could have fulfilled the role. They all had that aspiration of world power and domination, but they fail. What was it that made them fail? Well, the Bible tells us, you did. You were in the way. The church was in the way. 
the church with, with its effect prayer has stopped what Satan wants to do. Do you think for a minute that he's waiting because he's a kind gentleman, wants to get a few more, more people saved? He would come immediately and devour, but uh, he's not allowed. He's held back. He's like going to the zoo. Well, the old zoo, I'd have to say, where they had cages. Remember, and the tigers would pace back and forth, and you'd look there at the tiger and so forth, and you'd make faces at him because he couldn't touch you, right? But he was restrained, and the devil's restrained right now. He's on a chain, and he can only do so much. And uh, we might say he can only do as much as we let him do. Believers need to be prayed up. Believers need to be fired up. Believers need to be an avid witness for Christ. We can't be disappointed. I mean, all these things that Satan throws at the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we can't be disappointed in all that. Uh, you know, our, our feeble knees will give way and our hands will be down, you know, and so forth. And we'll just walk around morose. No, no, God wants, God's people ought to be confident. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. And so we have the power and the and the promise. So he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. If you like to look in the uh, original languages, I think you have a great English translation. There's no reason to go back, but you can look at this and understand letteth and withholdeth and uh, those words uh, coming here to uh, the Greek word katiko, which means to hold back, restrain, just as I've said before, to hinder the progress. And um, So, here we have the mystery of iniquity already working in the world and making its progress. And here's the church standing against it, the great preserving power of the church. He who now letteth will let, well, until he be taken out of the way. And then the devil will dominate the hearts and minds of men and women. And those that reject the gospel, unfortunately, will be open to strong delusion. They've had their chance here and they've heard the gospel. And now the spirit is gone and the church is a witness is gone. And what, is, what are they left with at that point? But the deception of Antichrist. And they'll gladly take the mark of the beast and follow the government of the world and get ready for what's coming next. I mean, really, the governments uh, that we now have uh, ruling over us essentially want to control lives. That's what they're all about. Amen. In Revelation, we find, because thou hast kept... The word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. This is a pre-tribulation concept. The hour of temptation speaks of the seven years of tribulation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So uh, we're kept from this simply because we're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, it will be time, come up hither, he'll say. And that will be that. Titus tells us, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We're going to be talking about good works here shortly. Isn't this part of the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your God which is in heaven. So your Father which is in heaven. So clearly, good works... Uh, don't save us, but they follow a true salvation experience. Once we're redeemed from all iniquity and purified by the blood of Christ and now indwelled with the Holy Spirit, we now seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And we look for his coming. And don't let anybody take the hope of his coming away from you. The modernists are doing it. They're saying, well, you know, uh, he already came in the first century. I mean, whatever constructs they have, it's idiotic. We're in the kingdom now, you know, kingdom now, dominionists, they think this is the kingdom. I mean, what, what a disappointment. Is this it? Is the best we can do? I, I can't believe it for a minute. Evil men will wax worse and worse. Count on it until the Lord comes. But we can exert an, an opposite pressure against that evil and thwart the onslaught of that evil. Are you happy tonight in the Lord? It sounds like a few of you might be with me tonight. So come on, folks. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, hmm, wherewith shall it be salted? So it is therefore thence, thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, trodden underfoot. And man, that is a sad verse right there. That is the sad state of a powerless church. And so in Revelation chapter 3, to the church, the dead church, the church at Sardis, 
I mean, when you see the seven churches, you can see seven of those churches as we speak this moment right now in this current age that we're living in. There's one uh, type of that church everywhere you go. I hope this is a church of Philadelphia. I hope we're in love and that it's an open door and that we show the love of Christ one to another and that we show it to a lost world. So, but the church at Sardis is a peculiar church. It seems to come there after the, you know, it's the church of the Reformation. It's the church that has a name. It's alive, but it's dead. Denomination churches, you know, mainline denomination churches, your Lutheran churches and the Presbyterian churches and the Methodist churches. I mean, they're dead. Uh, they fo follow ritual and form. And I mean, they're, 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 there's no life there. Ichabod written over most of those churches. So under the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. And that's an interesting study. And the seven stars, that would be the seven churches. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest, but you're dead. A dead church. Uh, what an insult to the, to the salvation that Jesus has wrought on that cross. That a church should be dead. That Christians should be dead. God help us. Let us be alive in Christ. Uh, and let us fight back. All of the, uh, the, the spirit of slumber and indolence that the devil would put upon us. And uh, let us awake unto righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of the truth. Speak this to your shame. Uh, when it's time to speak for him. And what opportunities. Oh, look what the devil did with the pandemic. Shuts doors and so forth. I can't believe how much ministry we, we lost in the three years. Uh, but uh, the doors are opening uh, little by little here. And we're going to, uh, you know what, when you go back and do some of the ministry again, I don't know, I, I feel as though I've got to give, uh, redouble my efforts. Uh, whatever I gave before, I have to give more than I gave before because we lost all that time. And souls have been plunged into an eternal darkness because of it. And the devil is gleeful over this. But uh, the church, gates of hell cannot prevail against the true church. So you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Christians should be alive with the gospel, alive with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter says, for the time has come that judgment must begin first at the house of God. It has to begin with us. Too many Christians are complacent, self-satisfied. They think they're doing enough. I, I, I don't think I'm doing enough. I hope nobody here thinks we're doing enough. There's much more that we could be doing and ought to be doing for the cause of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, who have you led to Christ recently? Uh, I, well, let's, let's speak that to our shame. Amen. We should be able to have that kind of an influence in people's lives, and a long-lasting one. You know, I don't want to see temporary salvation. I want to see people that mean it, sold out for God. Uh, so, if the righteous scarcely be saved, what could that mean? scarcely be saved I mean just barely there hmm where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear I mean the, the obvious thing is if we're if we're not on fire for God if we're not excited about the gospel what do we expect from the lost let this sink down in our hearts and say you know by God's grace I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a better effort than ever before in my life there's not much time left, beloved. So, uh, if you believe that the signs of the time are everywhere, uh, with the earthquakes in diverse places as there have been for centuries of time, but all right, it could be a sign that Jesus is coming soon. And everywhere you go, people seem to think that. That's how desperate the circumstance seems to be. It might well be we're living in the last generation. Wouldn't that be something now? There's much work to be done because we've got to collect as many souls before the terrible judgment day. Amen. So the man that wandereth in the, out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Then God help us get out of that congregation real fast. The man that wandereth out of the way. There they are. Ah, uh, listen. I don't see much of this here. Because if I see it, I'll do this every once in a while. You know, and see somebody doing that stuff. At first, I was thinking, well, they must be praying. But nobody prays for an hour. And uh, so they're not to realize. 
But I understand people are on medication, people have jobs and they, they don't get much sleep, so they come to church. As one woman said once, well, we're, we're very comfortable with your preaching. It's, we're not worried, <laughs> you'll say the right thing, and so they go to sleep in the meantime. But we're really not talking about physical slumber here. We're talking about spiritual slumber, far worse. This kind of inertia, uh, God detests. If you want to read about revival, you would get Ravenhill's books. He's, they're easy to read. There's uh, maybe 150 pages, but uh, very powerful. How many of you have gotten Ravenhill before? I think a number of you have told me you got those books. He writes in this one, the tragedy of this last hour is that we have too many dead men in pulpits giving out too many dead sermons to too many dead people. There's a strange thing that I've seen even in the fundamentalist circles. It is preaching without unction. What is unction? I hardly know what it is, but I know what it is not. Or at least I know when it is not upon my own soul. Preaching without unction kills instead of giving life. They're very convicting words here. Anybody that has the great privilege to teach or to preach the word, um, we should do this with much trepidation. We're going to be accountable when we stand before men. And that's why we can't fear what men may do or what they may say. We can't, as Ezekiel say, we can't look at their faces and wonder if there's a, you know, there's a distaste for what's being given and then, you know, the temptation is to back away. We all want to be liked. We all want to be popular. We all want to be loved. But that is not our calling. Our calling is to tell the truth. And that requires unction. Unction, the, the word itself just, you know, oil. It means the oil of the Holy Spirit. Something that's unctuous is, you know, it's oily. And we want to be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit, the dynamic. And then, of course, that oil in our lamp will bright, brightly shine for a long, long time. Remember the, the virgins that had their lamps, and their lamps were, five of them were foolish. They only brought enough and say, oh, well, I thought the Lord was coming soon. They were all preterists. They said, the Lord's coming soon. And the, the other five were wise. They said, we don't know the day or the hour. So we, we brought plenty of supply here. And they said, well, give us some and lend it. Oh, no, 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 we want, we got to keep, you have to get it for yourself. No one can lend you the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so you have to get it for yourself. And uh, when they went back to get it, uh, the door was closed. And how sad, Amen. the powerless church. So there, he says, uh, preaching without unction kills instead of giving life. The unctionless preacher is a savor of death unto death. The word does not live in, unless the unction is upon the preacher. Preacher, with all thy getting, get unction. Unction cannot be learned, only earned by prayer. Unction is God's knighthood for the soldier preacher who has wrestled in prayer and gained the victory. Victory is not won in the pulpit by firing intellectual bullets or wisecracks, but in the prayer closet. Brethren, we could uh, well manage to be half as intellectual if we were twice as spiritual. Preaching is a spiritual business. A sermon born in the head reaches the head. A sermon born in the heart reaches the heart. A spiritual preacher will under God produce spiritually minded people. Unction is not a gentle dove beating her wings against the bars outside of the preacher's soul. Rather, she must be pursued. She must be won. And so, characteristics of the congregation of the dead. Uh, they uh, there are no functional prayer gatherings. Within dying churches, few people show up to prayer and seek God together. Uh, since they have no sense of his presence. Uh, that is, uh, he is present in the midst of them. Now, isn't that a sad commentary? Amen. Prayer is essential. Nothing can happen without it. Amen. So they asked uh, Spurgeon, you know the story, I've told it a thousand times, but this fellow came early to the magnificent metropolitan church in London, England, where uh, Spurgeon held forth uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday nights, and he would preach to 5,000 people. They would have to turn people away. Uh, he was that dynamic and unctuous a preacher. And a, a, a curiosity seeker came to the Metropolitan Tabernacle early in the, uh, before the service and came into the auditorium, it was a, a cavernous, if you've ever seen pictures of it, and uh, came in and uh, no one being there, he just kind of took it all in. 
and he began to think to himself about the grand architecture involved. And he thought, what heats a place like this, you know, so vast and so forth? At that time, Spurgeon um, appeared, uh, um, man not knowing who Spurgeon was, thinking perhaps he was the janitor or a trustee of some kind. And uh, he said to Spurgeon, uh, I wonder what is it that heats this place? And he said, oh, you'd like to see what heats this place. He says, well, come with me, follow me. And he takes him downstairs uh, to a room where gathered were the deacons of the church, all with their faces on the ground, praying for the power of God to descend upon the service that morning. And Spurgeon said to the man, there, there is what heats this church. So, and I sense it every time I preach is that I have people, I know there are people that are praying for me. I'm humbled by it. But people tell me all the while, I'm praying for you. I pray for you. Every day people say that. And I think, I can't let them down. I have to have something from Almighty God here. I have to have something that will move people since they're praying so hard for it. So keep it up for all, by all means. But the church can do nothing without prayer warriors. Amen. So there is no expectation for answered prayers. Few, if any, uh, pray together since there is no anticipation uh, that God will actually answer prayers. When you're in a church without faith to believe God, it is, uh, it is either dead or dying. The presence of God is missing in the assembly of the saints. Metaphorically, the heavens are like brass over the skies of uh, dead churches. There's uh, no sense of God's presence during worship. Uh, even though Jesus promised that where two or three were gathered, there am I in the midst of them. So the characteristics of the congregation of the dead, the power of God is not manifest. When there are no instances of God's divine intervention in a church, it, it can be a sign that the church is dead or dying. The word of God is presented without authority or anointing. The religious leaders who uh, practiced a dead faith during Jesus' time were shocked when they heard Jesus speak because he taught with authority and not as the scribes. In dead or dying churches, the preacher has no unction to ins instill faith and motivate action or convict of sin. Sixth, a few of any people are saved or get baptized. In the early church, the Lord regularly added people to the church. When there are no people being saved or baptized, it is a sign the Lord is no longer working in their midst. You know, it's been the one thing in 49 years of ministry that I've always at least delighted in. With whatever disappointments come in ministry, certainly the excitement of newborns to see people saved uh, and to know that their lives are being changed. There, to me, is no greater joy than that. As small as the number may be, it's still exciting to me. It still excites my soul to think that God would still use his work to speak to lost people. Every church service is predictable by the minute. <laughs> people, I don't know how many times people say, you ought to be on television. I said, I would not last three weeks probably on television. I'd say something that they, that'd be it. I'm, they'd, they'd cancel me, right? Secondly, it's very, very expensive. Thirdly, how many more TV preachers do we need? Plus, it'll encourage people to stay home and watch church on television. That's not church. So uh, I thought to myself, <laughs> we don't need to be on TV. What we need to do is is satisfy those that come and make the effort to hear that word. But if you go on TV, the other thing is you have to limit the time. You see, so there's this, the choir has to sing a couple songs. Congregation sings a song. Of course, since you're on TV, you've got to sell something, right? Your tapes, your fine tape series or DVD series for a mere $49.95, right? Cost you a dollar to produce them, but that's all right, $49.95. And, uh, and then the sermon, which lasts for about maybe 28 minutes. But it all has to be timed because you have to fit into a time slot. 
the Holy Ghost can't be timed, as a matter of fact. And if there's a true revival, nobody will want to go home. So, so he says, uh, whether it be uh, the high church services, the non-denominational mega church, when every aspect of the worship, uh, liturgy, and preaching is predictable, as if choreographed to the minute, then it may uh, reveal there is no room for the Holy Spirit to operate. Like Samson of old, the Spirit uh, has departed from the people. <clears throat> Eighth uh, characteristic of the Congregation of the Dead, there is no pattern of disciple-making. You know, here's a, here's a marvelous thing. Now, we have people that come into the church almost every week that remain, that people haven't met yet. But you know, there are opportunities to disciple people here. Uh, they're almost hungry for it. They're longing for it. And uh, it, it would do us well to take up with strangers and to, and to be able to greet them and to know who they are and then to disciple them and to bring them along in the faith. I mean, that's part of the glory of the church body uh, is, to, is to serve to serve others, and of course, to bring people uh, to a better understanding. So, uh, bottom line in all churches is making uh, committed Christian followers better uh, known as disciples. So, uh, and it doesn't matter how large a church is. What matters is uh, how <clears throat> many mature uh, sons are being developed that will positively affect the create order. <clears throat> Ninth, the people jockey for position and titles. I can, I can honestly say that doesn't happen here, and I'm glad for that. Not in, people are not interested in being mentioned, known. Uh, people here have a wonderfully humble spirit about serving. They don't, they don't need it to be advertised. They're not looking for position. And uh, because I've told you before, and I believe with all my heart, and that is, there's one position, and that is servant. If you, want to, if, you want to, if you want to be a Christian and a follower of Christ, you'll be a servant. It's a servant's heart. We're not looking for recognition. We're not looking for title. We're looking to serve and to do it humbly. Uh, not forgetting that God remembers everything that you do for his cause. But the people jockey for position and titles. When people are not uh, seeking the glory of God, they depend even more upon getting affirmation from men. Hence, a church without the presence of God will most likely have a hierarchical culture for people uh, posturing for positions and titles. The less you know God uh, intimately, <clears throat> the more your identity will be connected to credentials and titles. Tenth, there is no divine sense of mission and purpose. When there is no vision, the people perish. When a congregation is dead or dying, they have uh, no compelling transcendent purpose. And, uh, not, uh, and that, that motivates them to fulfill their biblical calling. Hey, this goes on, doesn't it? Few people volunteer to serve. Psalm 110 tells us. <clears throat> says that people will volunteer or offer themselves willingly in the day of his power. Consequently, in dead or dying churches, very few people volunteer to serve in the ministry. Or people will say they have their own ministry and so on. But, uh, I mean, that's not the spirit of a congregation. The spirit is, is to serve together, corporately, as a congregation. And look for opportunities to serve collectively in the great uh, warfare. Few people support the church with tithes and offerings. And Jesus said, where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. Thirdly, uh, the 13th, uh, the community does, doesn't get impacted around us. So God... Uh, called believers to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. <clears throat> when our lamp goes out, the surrounding community is no longer changed by the power of the gospel. This is a true sign of revival. Um, yeah, judgment first begins in the house of God, no question, right? So we've got to get the church revived. But a true revival goes beyond the church and has influence in, in the society uh, in general and certainly at large and, and then of course beyond that in the scope of an, an entire nation. And that's what the uh, various Wesleyan revivals, the Whitfield revivals, the Great Awakening, the Jonathan Edwards revival, uh, and those that you read about. And of course, the paradigm of the Bible in the book of Acts, where uh, we've got whole cities coming out to hear the gospel, and great conversions, and dynamic repentance, like at Ephesus, where they took all the 
books of curious arts and magic and their uh, drugs and they burned them uh, and said no more of this and, and I mean that's a sign that a community has indeed been touched by the power of God because of the uh, church that's nestled within it, the local church. All right, so salt that loses its savor. We could use the expression backsliding, even though it's an Old Testament expression. And uh, it's one I'm loath to use generally because, well, I understand how people see it, people think of it. But uh, when we look at the biblical evidence for backsliding, this doesn't bode well for the backslider. Backsliding Israel, for instance. These weren't people that were following God, I can tell you that. Uh, and so I would have to say their salvation pretty much would have to question their salvation. So those that are using the expression backslidden, well, I'm back backslidden. Uh, in other words, uh, oh, I know better and I know how I ought to be, but you know, for now I'm just living in the world and with, with no desire to come back out of it. You know, we see Peter denying the Lord three times, but it was a terrible remorse that came to him. He wept bitterly, it says. And when opportunity uh, came, he was revived. He repented of that uh, and never to go back in his, into that uh, cowardice that uh, was demonstrated at the cross. So uh, it seems to me that when a person, a believer perhaps is worldly or carnal and, and lives in that fashion, he's going to come out of that. He's not going to stay in it. A godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. In other words, you won't be turning back to it. So Peter says the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. So if it first begin at us, then what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So this is a rhetorical question. Uh, so the church, if the church is in a backslidden case, what, where, where does the worldling come into the picture? So here it is in the Old Testament conce concepts, and Jeremiah likes to use the word, the Lord said unto me in the days of uh, Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain under every green tree, and there she hath played the harlot. He's talking about idolatry. And would you consider these people saved? They're, they're worshiping idols. Well, we'll leave the judgment to Almighty God. But, I mean, it's a terrible condition of heart to be called a backslider, truly. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Now that is a judgmental statement, filled with his own ways. This does not sound good. In our studies on Wednesday night, we were just uh, touched upon the uh, chastisements of God. Uh, your sons, it says, uh, what uh, son is he that the father hath not chastened? So in other words, God uh, does not let his children just go off and do what they want to do. And so he chastens them. And it makes them feel the uncomfort, uh, uncomfortable uh, spirit of uh, where you are as a backslider. And so you, you rush back to the arms of Christ. So the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Uh, that does, it's a very negative statement uh, and a judgmental statement. So here we have, of course, uh, Barnabas determined to take uh, John, whose surname was Mark, but... <clears throat> Paul thought not good to take uh, him with them. He departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And that's a terrible moment for him. Uh, but we're going to consider the fact that this is a very young disciple. And uh, in the face of persecution, it would take uh, one who had some metal, you know, some, some, his spirit was steeled, uh, like Paul and Barnabas. They were used to being beat up for the gospel. When John Mark sees this, it frightens him, and he, he runs for it. We're glad to know that he repents of that backsliding and joins the group again. And uh, though Paul at first didn't want to take him in, later he was glad to receive him. There is the case of Demas, who was a follower and apparently a true believer. And what happened to him? Uh, he had forsaken the work, having loved this present world, and has departed in Thessalonica. And uh, it, this is so very, very sad. And I, I can think of so many here that have come and gone. And they did so well for a while. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. And, and then you check up on them and, you, and oh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'll be back. And so, but they, they never come back. And you wonder, are they saved or lost? And I, I don't even know what to make of it. Uh, it seemed, I mean, that their heart was so genuine and they wanted to live for Christ. And, 
uh, they gave up uh, various sins and so on. It all sounds so well, but uh, only God can see what's really going on in the heart. The only thing I can say is, look, if there's an evil heart of unbelief in you, quench it immediately. It's the devil tempting you, trying to draw you back into perdition. We think of Lot, and what a miserable testimony his is. He left a godly uncle, Abraham. He wanted more land. He coveted the well-watered land of Sodom, of all places. He remained in Sodom after he was delivered. Remember, there was a great war. Abraham had to come to his rescue. It was the first battle of Armageddon with 10 kings, and Abraham comes and rescues him. That should be enough. And he said, you know, I'm getting out of this place, and I'm going to dwell in the wilderness in tents. But no, no, he loved the city too much, and, you know, I guess he loved all the uh, creature comforts. He raised disrespectful children that when he went to them and said, now, the angel of the Lord has warned us. We've got to get out of here. And, and, uh, and they mocked him. His sons-in-law mocked him. And his daughters went right along with it, apparently, and they stayed to their own destruction. Uh, I mean, what a miserable case that is. A, a man that knows better and his children are lost. I mean, it's, who can live with that? I'd be living in grief all my life. He was slow in leaving the city. Uh, and, of course, we find after he got out, he got drunk. And so, uh, and people often do this, you know. They're, in, they're depressed, and so uh, in this case, they go out, they, uh, uh, today we have other things that people use, uh, you know, some sort of form of intoxication, some way of forgetting their troubles and all this and so on. Now marijuana, is the, we want to make it medical marijuana. If we get Senator Fetterman back, uh, he's going to run a bill through uh, the Congress, no doubt half the people will vote for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, legalize marijuana, you know, have people high driving cars and so forth. Really idiotic stuff. But people maintain they have to have that. They can't get on without their drugs, they say. And so he got drunk. He was so depressed. His wife dead. His daughters burned up in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and so uh, instead of falling on his face and thanking God that he and the two daughters were saved, he instead decides to celebrate uh, by going out and getting drunk. And then, of course, we know this abysmal act of incest was committed. So you're the salt of the earth, but he also said you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it may give light to all that are in the house. Uh, I mean, what imagery this is, right? So he uses, uh, he uses the candle and he uses the city on a hill. Uh, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Uh, and, and so the idea is it's a beacon of light uh, because it's in a prominent position. Everyone can see it shining uh, in the midst of darkness. And that's how the church of God should be. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He says, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. <laughs> So uh, that's the notion of this. I mean, it's almost laughable, right? Why don't you, would, would you put a, put a bushel over a candle? Why, why light the candle? Then you're, gonna, then you're gonna put a bushel over it. Uh, what good would it? Take the bushel off and let it, put it on a candlestick and let it shine so that the whole house has light. We just had all, all this uh, terrible winds that came in uh, for a couple of days. Anybody here loses their power? And uh, people without power. And I'll tell you, it's an eerie feeling when the power goes out, isn't it? And uh, at night, and all the lights are out. And then you look out the window, there's nothing. It's a total desolation, right? <laughs> and it's a little eerie. And what do you do? You run for your flashlights, right? You go get a candle. You light a candle. You, you don't want to be in the darkness. That's a fearful thing almost, the darkness, right? Unless you're Aaron Rodgers. Who spent what four days in a dark room by himself and so forth, just with his own thoughts, smoking peyote or whatever he was doing and so forth. People looking for the truth, you know. There's better things, easier things. I was, uh, as a as a child, I was in Macbeth. I was the the son of Macduff. If you're familiar with uh, with that scene, I was in one scene and I was killed. It was a shame, but. Uh, it was at the Pittsburgh Playhouse, and they had uh, contracted two uh, 
budding actors and uh, actor and actress, and that was uh, Robert Loggia, who la later became, I forget, some television star that you would know, Robert Loggia, and he's been in a lot of films and so forth thereafter, and uh, Salome Jens, who was also a very famous actress. And that was uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. They both believed in the Stanislavski school of method acting. Uh, in method acting, you become the part. Uh, so you go in a dark room before you're about to go on stage and you meditate and you become Macbeth and you become Lady Macbeth. You, you don't want anybody interrupting you and so forth. <laughs> I accidentally opened the door uh, that Salome Jens was there and she looked I thought she was going to hiss at me, and so forth. And I said, oh, oh you know, sorry, and backed up. Um, method acting, getting into the role, or Aaron Rodgers going off for four days on a retreat, you know, by himself, just alone with his thoughts. Well, I mean, but total nonsense. They asked, asked one of the greatest actors, I guess, of all time, you would have to say, uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier, uh, and they asked him, they said, what do you think of method acting? He said, why don't those people just learn how to act? <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, get into the part. You know, I'm Macbeth. I am Lady Macbeth, and so forth. I'm an idiot. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with anything. Oh, light, yeah. No light, no light, you know. The people in the darkness hate the light. Right? John 3 tells us they hate the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But we're coming with the light, and we're shining the light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Paul took up the theme in the second chapter of Philippians when he says that you may be uh, blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and uh, perverse nation, among whom... He shine his lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Light, right? So, God has called his people. Uh, we're blameless, harmless. Our example has to be right, in other words. Uh, the world loves to mock Christianity. They've got plenty to mock. They've got those pedophile priests they can point to and say, what phonies and hypocrites. I have to agree with you. They can point to... Uh, you know, the television evangelists and say, what, hypocrites and, you know, multi-million dollar uh, estates that they live in and yachts and super airplanes. I have to agree with them. I mean, it's, it's sad. The state of affairs is sad. And people use that. Of course, the devil is behind all this, right? You know, these folks are... I, I want to be, uh, be genuine, don't you? We want to be genuine. We want to be real. We want people to be able to see Christ in us. That means getting us out of the way to the best of our abilities and to, and to let the light shine through us to others that they might actually be able to um, see Christ in our countenance. That you might be blameless so that they can't point and say, oh, yeah, I know about that guy. He did this, that, and the other thing. So he ran off with a woman and did that. Wait, wait can't have any of that. If we, if we want to be a credible witness, our life has to be right. Blameless, harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. Can't find something to rebuke. In the midst, there we are. You know, the Amish, sometimes we admire them. They're out there cloistered. They live reclusive lives. We say, now that's maybe how we should all be. Just go out there in the farm somewhere and just forget this world. You get that attitude sometimes. You don't want to have anything to do with it. The older you get, by the way, the more splenetic you become. I don't want anything to do with it and so forth. It's just me and my family. I don't even trust my family. You know, that's where you get after a while. Crotchety, bilious, sour, bitter on life. Can't be of much use for the Lord. Well, obviously, God doesn't want us out somewhere cloistered. He wants us to be in the midst of this lostness, in the midst of the darkness, shining as a light in the midst of it. Not becoming like the darkness. So all we can do is be a, a rebuke to the lost condition. This perverse nation of ours, the United States of America. Perverse now for a number of generations. 
And uh, it is a pathetic case. Paul later writes uh, to the Ephesians and he says, For ye sometimes were darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then he says to uh, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So uh, there we are, shining as lights in the midst of all this perversion and saying, Now that's not right. That's not right. And uh, they'll cancel us. That's what they want to do is cancel culture. That's, they want to put a, a muzzle on you and shut you up uh, and shout you down. And that's, that's, that's the way the liberals really are all about. Uh, they're liberal-minded as long as you agree with them. If not, they'll shut you down. And this is what all communists do ultimately. You know, all opposition has to be silenced. So um, thank God for that passage that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So it is a shame even to speak of the things which they do in secret, right? But all things are reproved that, uh, that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. What's it mean? When you make something known and you publish abroad and say to people, it is wrong to drink alcohol, to go out and be drunk. It is a sin against God. You've just brought light to people that are living in darkness. Now, right away, they'll say, what, what, Jesus drank wine? Or what, they're going to bring whatever arguments, sophistical arguments that they've learned from the devil, and they're going to bring it all up to you, and so on. I, we'll have to take all that. But you did what you were supposed to do. You gave them fair warning. If they don't heed the warning, that's on them. But you did what you needed to do. Ezekiel was the watchman. And the watchman has to give the warning. If he doesn't give the warning, the blood of those that uh, are slaughtered in the battle because you didn't warn them to prepare will be held against you. That's what blood guiltiness is in the spiritual sense. So uh, as long as we can say, as Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men. I went from house to house, he said at Ephesus. He told them the truth. So um, whatsoever maketh uh, manifest is light. So if you make manifest, if you make known what the truth is, you're the light of God. And a lot of people, you're the only light in their life. I can tell you that right now. The next generation is a difficult one. They call them Generation Z. They're running out of alphabet. So what are they going to do with the next generation, right? I guess they'll start Roman numerals. But they are a particularly difficult generation. Um, because they, most of them were raised in, with single parents. They're, they're, they didn't have a father and a mother, and mostly didn't have fathers. And so it would be very, they're, they're already a skeptical generation. They don't believe much. They've been disappointed early in their lives. And oftentimes that leads to unbelief. You know, I wish it was the opposite. I wish people, and people that often tell me about the terrible things they went through as, ch as children. First I say, listen, you have my full pity I feel sorry for you. And then they say, well, I don't want you to feel sorry. I, but I do. I feel sorry for you that you were handicapped in that fashion. I think every child raised in a Christian home ought to thank God that they were raised in a Christian home with consistent Christian parents that made them go to church and Sunday school and all. That is a great safety net that you have. It doesn't save you, but it's enough to give you opportunity. You know right from wrong, as a matter of fact. So... You want to keep all of that in mind. But in a wonderful way, we make manifest wherever we go what the truth is. And the truth is known in poor people in our generation Z. They, they don't know what the truth is. They are shocked when you tell them different things. I've told, <laughs> ministering to some very recently. And they, they, they like, they're taken aback at what you're saying. They say, well, what? I say, yeah, that's a sin. They don't know it's a sin. They're... they're their, their conscience is seared. They don't, know that it's, they don't know that it's wrong. And then you tell them these things. They, they look curiously at you. But I tell them with all authority, no, 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 it, this is wrong in the sight of God. And you will answer to God. You must repent. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So, Lord, we have to end on that point, but there's more to say and we pray uh, that we'll find all this teaching a very practical teaching, edifying, and it will strengthen us in many, many ways. So you help us, Lord, 
in our discourse of uh, this Sermon on the Mount, this great teaching that you gave to us, Lord. The golden truths, each line, Lord, upon each line. Uh, so make your truth manifest in our hearts. Then help us to be uh, giving out that manifesto, to give it out, Lord, freely and uncompromisingly and lovingly. If we love people, we will tell them what the truth is. Lord, how we pray that hearts will receive. There still has to be the still small voice of conscience, as smothered as it has been through the years of brainwashing, there's still that voice of conscience. They do know, innately, intrinsically, what is right and wrong. So help us, Lord, to provoke that conscience and make it alive again. Lord, we've, we saw some convicting points tonight about the powerless church, the congregation of the dead. And oh God, we pray that that will not be the characteristic of this place. That you will help us to be fervent in spirit, uh, fervent in the word. That Lord, when, when it's time to come to hear the word, we will come with prepared hearts. When it come, comes time to sing, to praise, to pray, we will come prepared to do so. Not caught off guard, but instead longingly, lovingly, wantingly, to be involved in a true spirit of revival. So help all of us in this, Lord. We, uh, we've been lulled to sleep, and the devil certainly uh, loves to uh, anesthetize us. So you help us, Father, to awake to our calling. We know what we should be and how we ought to be. Now, Lord, of course, tomorrow we'll wake up, and the world, uh, with all of its complexities, will be troubling us again, and we'll be back uh, probably in that same pattern. But I pray, Lord, somehow, that the, through it all, that the reality of the Spirit of Christ uh, will be in us, speaking to us about what we've heard today. Any in this room that might not be saved, I, how would I know? It's amazing you would be at a church on a Sunday night, but only God can look in your heart. I cannot. If you're not saved, I counsel you to come to Jesus. I tell you, it is the right life. It is the only life that guarantees some satisfaction and purpose and meaning. All else is just a delusion of the devil. When you come to him tonight, you open your heart to him. You receive him fully. You accept his terms of taking up the cross, denying yourself and following him, and you will never be disappointed. So let's stand as we close. If God is speaking to anybody that needs to come to the altar, I invite you to come now to just kneel down and speak to the Lord. Pour out your heart. Ask for his power and his blessing. Ask him to lead and guide this week. Those of you that have the great privilege to preach and teach that God would fill you with unction to accomplish his purposes. That we would not just give out some blather that we would give out the anointed message of God and that would have its full impact upon the lost and the saved. Thank you for the Lord's Day, a day of great celebration. Thank you for Sunday school and morning service and evening service and every opportunity, Lord, that we can come into this place, this safe haven. You've placed us up on a hill, Lord, like a, like a city that sits on the hill, a light. May we light up our community, Lord. We've made some headway in the neighborhood here at times. And I pray, Lord, that we can have a better influence than ever before. Our good works would be seen and understood and contemplate that people would see in us genuine Christians and perhaps give them the curiosity to seek why we are so different. Now as we go this from this room, Lord, help us to take with us a generous portion of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him, 
and you can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thank you.